and uh, uh, talks in the open lecture series. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rajiv Khandelwal. You know, when we were, we sort of think about whom to invite for these open lectures, you sort of try to think of who should our students listen to at this point of time, okay? And then I started thinking, well, what's what's been some of the biggest policy disasters that have taken place in the last couple of years? So last year's migrant crisis would definitely uh, rank high amongst the policy disasters. Uh, you know, all the images of migrant workers working from the cities uh, to the villages and so on. So I was thinking about, you know, who, who, you know, who one could invite to sort of talk about these issues. And then Rajiv came to mind. Rajiv is a friend. Uh, and I know about the work that he's been doing with migrant workers. He's been working, he and his organization have been working for a long time. Uh, they're based out of Udaipur. Uh, the work, as you can see from his bio that we circulated, the work that he has done has been recognized. He was selected as an Ashoka Fellow. Uh, he was nominated, he was uh, selected as an entrep entrepreneur of uh, the year by the World Economic Forum. But you know, these are all uh, accolades that he has gotten from the development practice side. I should also point out that he's also a popular discourse has also recognized him. He recently made an appearance in Korn Banega Karodpati. <laughs> uh, and uh, I will, I probably will have one question for him about that at the very end, if I do get the uh, opportunity. Uh, so without further ado, students, I am going to let uh, Rajiv take the floor. Rajiv, you wanted to share some uh, something, right? I will come to that. I'll come. Let me okay, just make okay. a few opening You have been made a co-host, so whenever you want to, you can just start uh, sharing. Okay, Rajiv, go ahead. Thank you, Shubhashish, and uh, a pleasure to meet your colleagues and your community at Jindal. And I mean, I know about the Institute, but never had the fortune, good fortune of coming there in person. And I hope that will happen as things open out and become more normal. Uh, I thought we will, you know, talk a little bit about where do migrant workers stand today, um, given that we are deep into the pandemic and now coming out of it. And as you said, what we saw last year was very telling, you know, it brought people out and put them right in the center of the nation's consciousness, right? And these are not people who were uh, not known about, they were just invisible. And a lot of problems that we saw last year became, were not new problems. They were amplification of what already existed. And the lockdown brought out, uh, you know, brought these out in a very aggressive and a very brutal way. Yeah. We are, uh, one of the things that I think everybody has got to know is that we are a country and economy shaped by migrant workers. We are not a static society. We are not a society or an economy where people stay where they were born only, they move and they move to work. They move both out of distress, but also out of opportunity. A lot of people who are here on the panel here today would also be, would also classify themselves as migrants, but obviously there's a huge difference in experience and privilege, you know, uh, uh, compared to what a migrant worker in a construction site or in a factory would, would be confronted with. Uh, so when I, when I talk about migrant workers, I talk about those who are part of the laboring kind of communities of our country. I talk about people who are uh, engaged manually uh, in the labor market. And I talk about people who are largely in the informal and unorganized, unorganized kind of spaces of, of our businesses and of our industries, right? <clears throat> Um, so, yeah, so what, what happened last year was, I think what the most telling image was of people walking back and of people going hungry, people getting locked and stranded in cities because of no transportation. And it is actually quite remarkable that when policy failed, uh, public came to rescue, you know, so there was a lot of very positive and immediate citizen action to support workers on the move or workers who were stranded, workers who were unable to access ration or access, access transportation. So you'll hear thousands of such stories everywhere where people came to help, right? Because that was the need of the hour, right? Uh, that period came and went and we've things normalized a bit. 
if you remember last year was not such a health emergency as it turned out to be this year i think the crisis whereas we had a migrant crisis last year we had a serious health emergency this year but it affected people again pretty badly including those who were in the world of work especially in the world of precarious and and informal work such as the that such as the one that migrant workers occupy right and the these two major lockdowns the one of last year and the one that we experienced it was a lighter lockdown this year has actually aggravated conditions at the very bottom end in a very very serious and significant way so while we can celebrate recovery and we can you know put out all kinds of uh, rates of gdp growth based on notional kind of benchmarks you know the reality is that workers are going through a very intensely problematic period of rehabilitation and recovery as we enter what i hope is a period of some normalcy post covid yeah <laughs> let me just uh, before i go further let me give you some an overview of migration in our country of labor migration in our country let me share a few slides here okay um uh, is this visible shubhashish it's it's loading yeah but yes now it's visible okay so you know the, i i often show this map it's a kind of a work in progress kind of map and the arrows actually show where people move from and where they move to okay and as you see the major arrows are coming from north and east to west and south north and east representing the more poorer and more kind of disadvantaged kind of regions and west and south relatively prosperous relatively better governed with more econ economic and employment opportunities here right there are these big corridors that have become very well entrenched over the last few decades for example from up and bihar major movement to delhi and uh, maharashtra mumbai and so on if you look at uh, uh, a new relatively new migration corridor uh, which is from odisha to all the way to gujarat and surat which is where one of the locations where we work and uh, you know almost 6 six, six and a half 7 lakh migrant workers just from ganjam district alone uh, come and work in surat pavalum sector uh, uh, kerala has by the way become one of the largest recipients of of migrants for migrant workers especially from bengal odisha and assam right there's almost 40 lakh migrant workers just in the last 5 years that is a stock of migration in in kerala itself so you know this is and things are actually very dynamic it's even the states that are labor surplus which are sending states like my state which is rajasthan or uttar pradesh or bihar it is not as if they don't have migrants from other parts of the country they do you know this is how it has become there is uh, uh, in fact migrants have become the preferred form of labor you know in the in the economy because they will work harder they will work longer hours they will not be unionized or collectivized easily they will not be able to make the claims the same claims as a local worker might be able to make so the whole economy is actually structured around the uh, movement and the presence of migrants now of course the big sending regions do continue to remain as i said uttar pradesh bihar jharkhand chatisgarh odisha bengal rajasthan whereas south uh, and uh, west india like gujarat and maharashtra become major recipients it is not to say that south states the more affluent states do not have migration but a lot of their migration is actually contained within the boundaries of the state right so which makes a difference in terms of how policy plays out for people i think it is the reality of interstate migration that aggravates the problems of migrant workers in our in our country right i'll try and this okay these are just some numbers so construction is one of the largest uh, employers in the country it's you know 40 million to 50 million workers work here we are a large um, uh, country you know society employing domestic workers mostly women again 20 million workers 11 to 15 million workers just in the textile sector brick kilns employ 10 million there are mines and quarries that have migrant workers there is agriculture labor in again very telling numbers hotels and restaurants and there is a whole host of other kind of manual oriented work that migrants kind of they populate right 
So uh, this, uh, you know, this is a photograph just outside our office in Ahmedabad. Okay, these are not uh, people destitute. These are construction workers from Rajasthan who go to who go to Ahmedabad and work in the construction sites there. But this is, you know, they are forced to be in this this situation because of not having adequate housing, not have not being able to afford housing, right? And as we know that a lot of migrants who enter markets who come into the labor market are coming with endemic kind of disadvantages you know and the caste could be a, could be a disadvantage you know they are largely dalit and minority kind of communities who are overrepresented in the migrant kind of group a lot of migrants are actually especially you know among men are entering the market at very relatively young age without any skill or without any formal training and therefore they will join the market just at very kind of you know low levels of ages and so on. Many, many migrants will enter without identity documents. Of course, Aadhaar is more pervasive today, but for them to prove who they are continuously a problem, and I'll tell you, I'll come to that in a bit. Most most workers in our economy in our, who are employed do not have any social security. So, you know, the number is actually quite overwhelming. 93% of the entire workforce is informal which means they don't have any written contracts, they have no social security, they will not, many of them will not be able to prove their formal employment status if it were to come, if it were to be, you know, established. And many cases, uh, migrants are moving through uh, long chains of intermediaries, labor agents, and, uh, you know, through commission agents who are putting them to work, right? So there is no direct connection between them and the principal employer. And which is again the reason why so many work-based disputes and wage disputes arise for migrants. And obviously, given the nature of the work they do, which is which can be very hazardous, and given the conditions in which they work, they live, there is resultant very poor nutrition and poor healthcare. By the way, we are amongst the several kinds of migrant workers. The prevalence of tuberculosis, for example, is almost twice the national average. Yeah which is very, you know, quite remarkable that it tells you about the outcomes of work on people's bodies and their, and their, and their well-being, right? So, the, you know, this is just a little depiction, you know, in our case where I come from, in South Rajasthan, which is a big sending region, there's early entry at the age of 14 to 18, and there is also early exit, which is around 35, 40, people are actually back in their villages because they just cannot afford to be in cities anymore. Their wages have not gone up. Their bodies are wilting with illness and disease and exhaustion. And that is the time when the children are starting to migrate. So the economic life cycle of a migrant worker is actually a short one. Okay. It's just a time when our careers are peaking, you know, which would be mid thirties or something. A lot of people are actually coming back to villages uh, because they've run out of things to do or their wages are too, too low in the market. Yeah. So I'll come to the, you know, so those are the kind of issues and there are other issues around, you know, around uh, urban governance, you know, whether how do cities treat migrants. One of the things that you will know and that again last year proved, showed, showed us is that urban areas are very exclusionary of migrants, okay. They want people to work and then vanish and mostly migrants who are not permanent settlers in the city will not have access to proper housing, proper sanitation, proper, you know, recreational spaces. And, you know, all those things are kind of taken away because only their bodies and their, and their, their manual work is required, not their, they're not like citizens of the city as such. And which is all that we, that needs to change because we are not, this is a context in which my organization works, Ajinika Bureau, is an organization that supports migrant workers, especially in the Western India corridor, and we provide services and we work for, you know, to support their rights in the economy and vis-a-vis and -vis the state, right? We are not opposed to migration because it will never, it cannot be reversed. It cannot, it is not a phenomenon that can be uh, put out of, you know, circulation anymore, but we can certainly change the nature and the character of migration, okay? And which is what I want to come to, that for all the attention that migrant workers received um, last year, where are they today? Yeah, What happened to them? And who's, for all the uh, discussion around their well-being, how far have we come? 
from what I see, and I see very closely the markets of Gujarat and Maharashtra, things are actually pretty much back to usual. You know, it's business as usual. People are back to work in a lot of spaces. Wages have not restored to pre-COVID levels because business has been hit very badly. In several markets, such as textile or chemical or small manufacturing, the number of days of work has reduced. Okay, What people were, were able to find work for, say, 20 to 25 days is now down, down to 15 to 18 days. Interestingly, in several uh, um, areas, there is a shift from waged work that people are getting paid by the day, there's a shift from that kind of work to piece rated work that they will now get paid according to the quantity of work that they deliver. You know, it's a fundamental shift because it changes the identity of the worker. You know, you're no longer, uh, and you will certainly have no benefits or no entitlements because uh, you're not, you're just delivering a job. You're not employed, therefore. Uh, we've also found recently in a, in a, in a survey we did we surveyed about 6,000 migrants just recently, a couple of, couple of months ago. And we found that of the 6,000 migrants, 3,700 migrants were in deep debt, were in debt to the extent that whatever they were earning in the last three months, 45 to 55% of that earning was going to just retire the debt. And it was debt uh, which had not been just taken from private money, money lending sources, but also from microfinance institutions from formal sources because all the private providers, their relatives and friends and family were themselves in debt. So, you know, that kind of reality is what we are confronted with. Yeah. So, of course, you know, people get back to normal and, you know, we move on with our lives and we think about what can we, what can now be, um, you know, that what can we now do in the new post-COVID age. Work in several spaces comfortably move to the digital platform, okay? We, all of, many of us now know that it is totally possible to have a full, meaningful uh, kind of work life without uh, stepping out of, you know, your, your rooms. We can continue to do this, you know? And, but for a lot of the workforce, that is not, that was never an option and it is, it will never be an option. You know, they have to be involved physically in, in the things they do. And the conditions that were confronting them, they not only did not change, but also in some cases became worse than before, right? And some of that conditions are driven by stigma, by the fact that there is greater kind of sense of nervousness and anxiety about being, being infected. There is new found germophobia in the privileged middle classes and who will now impose all kinds of restrictions on, on workers as they enter the market. And so um, also, COVID has become a big excuse for compromising on wages and on work conditions. You know, COVID, COVID chal rahe. Abhi zada expenditure ki, zada kharcha mat karna hai. You know, that's the kind of argument that is being put out. But, but we still have an opportunity. You know, it is still not lost entirely from our minds and imagination. There is still enough people who think about what happened just last year. And I think if we can grab that opportunity, especially in its policy kind of uh, dimension, then maybe we can do something differently. And I would like to list out, spell out seven things that we need to do. I'm mindful of time. So I'll, uh, you know, I will wind up in the next 10, you know, seven to 10 minutes. Uh, and some of these things are structural in nature, more fundamental. And therefore I say they're more policy oriented. Because what was relief and emergency support oriented, I think we do that extremely well. We provide food, ration, medical supplies, transportation, you know, physical body help to people in distress. We've showed, we've showed that as a society, that even if the state becomes insensitive, even if police becomes brutal and all kinds of bureaucratic hurdles are imposed before, uh, you know, a graceful and dignified movement of workers, people rise to the occasion to help people, other people out. But some of the most structural issues and fundamental issues, which are more to do with policies still remain. And what are they? That what, what do we need to do differently? Okay. One of the things that we need to change very substantially is around the nature of people's, um, the, the, the relationship that workers have with the economy. 
with their employers, with the industry, with businesses at large. Okay. As I said, we are largely an informal economy. Largely our workers are informal workers. And with many, many of who will not be able, will not be able to prove their um, kind of work relationship. They'll not be able to establish the legitimacy of their of their connect of their connection with their employer because of the way market has become. There are so many layers in the market that for many construction workers who with, with who we work, they don't know who the builder or the site owner is. They only know the name of their immediate contractor, right? So we have to move from being an informal to a, being a more formally a uh, more more formal economy. So formalization of the workforce is one of the first policy imperatives that I call upon, that we have to start registering workers, okay, we have to start registering and identifying their employers with who they are working, not just the contractors, but also the principal employers, we have to start issuing IDs to workers, and we have to have written, not just oral verbal contracts, we have to move from being a ad hoc informal economy to being a society that respects and that values formal kind of work. It is extremely difficult because we are not even, we don't even, our morality, our economic morality doesn't operate like that. You know, we totally function on informal kind of arrangements. Right? So, but that is one of the major policy directions that we should be thinking about. And how we do that, I will come to that. That's, so formalization is the first policy imperative. The second policy imperative is around universalization. Okay. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a migrant worker, regardless of where he is from and regardless of where he works, he or she works, services should be fully accessible to him or her. So if there's a worker from Bengal who is seeking healthcare in Gujarat or is seeking uh, housing in uh, Rajasthan or is seeking education for his children in Maharashtra or is seeking social security in any other part of the country that uh, uh, that should be well within his or her right. Domicile should not affect access. So what happens today is that a worker from one part of the country will, will not be linked to any schemes so either of social protection or security or entitlements in any other part of the country. Okay. So they remain basically alienated. The reason why so many people are pushed out on the highways and streets is that they have no, they have no claims on the local, local entitlements. They have no housing, they have no healthcare, they have no ration. They even PDS is not available to workers who are working in such difficult and usually at very low kind of wages. So the second policy call is to universalize. So take away all these restrictions of state boundaries and domicile and make entitlements and linkages fully portable. Thirdly, we have to have serious reconsideration of what we pay our people. Our wage policy has to be significantly different. We are we are amongst the lowest paying economies of the world. And because we want to remain globally competitive, we try to pitch ourselves with Cambodia's and Vietnam's and Bangladesh's of the world. Whereas our food inflation, our cost of, our cost of living is significantly higher. Also, because we do not have enough public provisioning, which means by public provisioning, I mean, we don't have subsidized housing, subsidized, subsidized healthcare, for migrants, low wages become very damaging. It's very difficult for workers to survive at very low wages. So on an average, 40 to 60% of what workers would earn just go in surviving in the city. That little 30 to 40% is one is what is remitted. 40% of the entire documented workforce is below working below minimum wages, right? Below what is national legally mandated to be legal, to be minimum wage, but our enforcement mechanisms are weak. Since we are all informal, there's no way to establish, uh, you know, who gets paid what. And minimum wages itself is a problem. We have to raise the standard of minimum wage that we currently treat as acceptable in our country. Delhi government, for example, has said, you know, 15,000 to 18,000 is what is an acceptable 
which is quite all right. It is not a bad one. Government on its own count, two years ago said 375 rupees should be the minimum wage for of an unskilled worker, right? Rarely does it happen, especially at the very bottom end. You know? So we have to have serious reconsideration of what workers get paid. Otherwise, we are keeping a very vast army of workforce poor and hungry at the kind of uh, starvation kind of wages that we that we offer. So if wages have to be kept low, like in China, wages are not high, but everything else is subsidized and free and available. So housing is free, available transportation, healthcare, food. Either we guarantee that or we improve wages to match the market reality. So that's the third policy imperative. Fourth is around legal aid. That workers, because of the nature of their uh, relationship with the market, because of their informal nature, suffer enormous amount of wage losses, wage disputes, wage theft, and lack of compensation in the event of accidents, injuries, and trauma. Okay. We are one of the most dangerous workspaces in the world. You know, the number of accidents on shop floors, the number of falls on a construction site is the highest recorded anywhere. You know, the ILO reports will show you that. But we are also amongst the least kind of sensitive states to, to offering justice to workers who, are, who have not been paid properly, whose wages have been stolen or who are losing life and limb at work. So we need a whole policy uh, around provision of legal aid, which is outside the formal court system. We need almost an alternative fast track legal aid mechanism that can provide justice to workers in our in our society. Okay, that's the fourth. Fifth is around safety at workplace. As I said, the conditions in which our workers work is, are so hazardous, so dangerous. In, in, in Surat, in Ahmedabad, where we work in a textile market, textile processing area, there are at least uh, three to four electrocutions every month. Okay, every fourth or fifth month there is a major fire, and because the exit doesn't exist, workers can get charred inside. Not far from where you are in Gurgaon, there is documented evidence of workers, twenty to twenty-five workers losing their fingers in the automobile supply chain. These are little units that are supplying to Marutis and Hondas of the world. Okay, but small units, workers are losing their fingers. Twenty to twenty-five workers every month. That has to change. There has to be stronger implementation of safety standards for industry, not just at the factory level, but also in the supply chain, right? That policy has to become stronger. These are, these exist, but they're rarely enforced. And if they're enforced, you can get away by, uh, you know, uh, by all kinds of means, because there is no punitive action, really, right? So that's the fifth. Make our workspaces and our migrant slice safer. Number six is around housing, that we, you know, Roti Kapada Makan, housing has to be a fundamental right. And we cannot allow our work migrants to live in the kind of dingy, dangerous, dirty conditions that they, we allow them to pop, that they're, they're, they're offered in the cities. Look at the conditions our slums in. Please remember that migrants are not seeking permanent settlement in the city. They're not here to build their houses. They will work, they will go back to their villages. They will come and work for some time, they will go back. So what we need is dignified social public housing, which is affordable for migrants at a cost that, they, that matches their wages. And, and which, is, which is offered, again, regardless of where they come from, okay? Which is not segregated by caste and by ethnicity. It is available, like public housing for migrants. And I think because there was not enough housing, last year, which is what we saw people getting pushed out on the highways and streets of our country. Uh, let us remember that, you know, one very uh, perverse kind of housing is worksite housing. So which means that inside factories, you'll find lots of workers who are staying in the factory. You know, in we have so many cases here, which is like a virtual enslavement of the worker because that worker and his family is going out nowhere. They are just at the site. They will work 12 to 14 hours, right? So if we create option, then people will also have the option of leading or claiming some normalcy of their own lives. Because they can't afford rents, they will stay on pavements. 
and that again affects their health, their nutrition, their privacy, and which is why the stability at their work itself gets compromised. Housing is extremely important. It's the sixth major kind of policy that we have to focus on for migrants. And finally, the seventh one is around. It's more. It's more an advice, I would say. And I'm happy that some industries are picking it up. Is around industry accountability. Is around making sure, especially by that industry starts adopting a policy of downward, of downstream improvement of labor practice. Many industries, many large factories, large sites, large manufacturing facilities, especially with who are global players. If you go to their factory, their workplace conditions are excellent. Okay, their on-roll staff is looked after very well. Everybody is documented. They have a contract. Safety standards are followed. You know, all kinds of benefits and allowances are available to them. They have paid leave. By the way, paid leave is one of the rarest things to happen in our in our country for the workers. You know, those things exist for the on-roll staff. But in a lot of these spaces, a lot of these factories, fifty to seventy percent of the entire workforce is no longer on-roll. They are contract workers. Okay, they are not employed by the by the major the main employer. They they are employed by the contractor who's been outsourced part of that uh, that manufacturing or processing operation. Now there the the work standards the labor standards change. Okay, मतलब आधा हो जाता है लगभग half the things will happen other uh, the other other will not happen. If you go even further downstream to the supply chain to the vendors who are supplying to these industries, there is no visibility on work. Practices or the safety of workers at all. What workers are getting paid, the conditions in which they are working, that just doesn't matter. There's a lot of concern around environmental issues now. So you know, big companies will look at environmental conditions and you know whether people who are supplying to them are they polluting or not polluting, and or they have child labor or not. But nobody talks about labor, about the conditions in which workers are being are being engaged. And I think if industry takes on that. Uh, uh, adopts that policy of imposing labor standards, not just within, but on its contract workers, on its informal workers, welfare of the worker. Right? Uh, you know, there is a group of industries, and you know, I'm part. We are my organization, Ajivika Bureau. We are part of a initiative called Social Compact. Please look it up. You know, Social Compact has uh, several leading industries in the country who were moved by the plight of workers last year. Who came together and reached out to people like us to say, you know, we just don't want to do ration and transportation. What can we do better? And so we created a whole set of outcomes and, and standards that we are asking them to adopt for themselves and for their suppliers and their distribution channels, so that work can be conducted in a more dignified, in a more modern and progressive way. These are industries who understand that we invest in workers. It is not just net expenditure. It is actually. it is helpful for your own profit your own profitability good workers well fed workers safe workers will contribute more uh, substantially to your production and that is a model on which most of europe is based you know they haven't they don't look at workers as just extraction units of extraction but you know they try to see what can be done better china to a lot of big extent also has practiced that and they they go they you know they weak on the democracy front but you know they at least their workforce is really well looked after so industry kind of taking taking over that kind of policy is really important. so you know i'm leaving you with these ideas i know these are big ticket ideas and they are easy to talk about than to translate into operational kind of details what we have instead is a lot of right now we we are going through a national program for registration of workers okay major database will be created for workers everywhere you know in all across industries and sectors i am not sure what will happen with that database i am not sure if states will not impose new restrictions in access in in enabling workers to access their entitlements you know we need to move away from this idea that workers are just units of extraction you know that we just need them for the privileges and the prosperity of the urban economy whereas their rural their homes and their well being can be totally compromised thank you very much okay thank you rajiv uh, for a wonderful talk and uh, sharing these ideas you know rajiv had told me before that he'd like to keep this very interactive uh, so he'll throw out some ideas but uh, thereafter 
uh, he wants uh, the audience to jump in and ask him and engage him. So please ask your questions. Uh, let me join you, Sumashish, and thanking um, Mr. Rajiv Kandelbal for this talk. Um, this has been a subject that uh, I've been concerned about for a very long time. Um, I don't know how many of you know that um, the vice dean of our school, uh, Dr. Naresh Singh, was the uh, executive director of a commission on legal empowerment of the poor that had been set up by the UNDP and published uh, a volume called Making the Law Work for Everyone. And um, Arjun Sengupta was a member of that commission and I worked with Naresh when he was uh, putting together this report um, and it, the commission was represented by many eminent people from different countries. And one of the major recommendations was uh, about um, identity uh, of people, a legal identity and um, formalization of the informal sector you know, to a much greater extent than has happened. Um, and then there was also a section uh, which dealt with uh, implementing these recommendations, which had to do with identifying who are likely to be its champions and who are in much greater number, of course, are likely to be uh, its detractors who kind of stymie any effort that uh, people may make to um, give greater protection to those who do not have the protection of the law. And subsequent to that, Arjun Sengupta chaired a commission, uh, a committee on the organ unorganized sector in this country. Um, you know, very good economists uh, worked with him in the team. Um, Ravi Srivastav, uh, Kannan from CBS in Kerala, and others. And uh, Monte Kalavalia and Manmohan Singh simply shelved that massive piece of work that was done and the policy recommendations. They took no notice of it, right? And so this, therefore, I mean, you know, the, the Commission on Legal Empowerment for the Poor was, you know, quite quite a long time ago. And um, Arjun Sengupta subsequently, those recommendations. Um, so it doesn't matter what is the regime uh, in, in power, all of these political parties, and uh, when they come into government, seem to have a vested interest in continuing with the way things are. I mean, for instance, I mean, uh, uh, Shupriya Roy Chaudhary has just published a very, very good book uh, with Cambridge University Press on uh, Bangalore's uh, slums and the migrant workers who populate uh, many of those slums. And, and she points out that, uh, you know, under a government scheme, government is okay with handing out welfare, but the fundamental fact that you have to organize uh, and protect workers and that uh, labor intensive uh, modes of production is needed in this country because we still have uh, a very large amount of uh, workers, um, uh, people dependent on agriculture, even though its contribution to GDP is going down as it would in, a, in economies that progress but the number of people dependent on agriculture is very large. And that's because they don't have, you know, proper avenues of non-farm employment. Uh, and our policymakers don't seem to have given importance to that, don't seem to have given importance to how to protect workers. That is to ensure that the minimum wages are paid and certain basic conditions uh, of, at the work site are uh, maintained. So she points out that new schemes like skilling workers say Orissa skilling um, workers, uh, women from poor districts of Orissa being trained in garment making. And they come into the garment export sector, which has a substantial presence in uh, Bangalore, Bengaluru. And, and so they, they, are, they are just fodder to this, uh, uh, to this kind of thing. So it is not that their status, their incomes, their standard of living actually goes up. They're given the training because export quality work requires more care and um, some knowledge of, you know, 
you know, measuring and uh, uh, knowing how to design. Um, so it serves that purpose. So you can, but you're using them exactly in the same way as any other uh, sweatshop um, in, in the garment industry uh, that uh, historically in many countries in the world um, have had. And, you know, the March 8 uh, is International Women's Day because of a garment workers strike in New York City on, that happened to happen on the 8th of March uh, because of the conditions under which women were supposed to work. And so we ask then, you know, what has changed? You know, how to change this? That's the, and as a policy school, it's okay, we, we have a number of prescriptions about what needs to be done, but the big challenge is how to, how to get a democratic polity and its representatives and policymakers to act on what is long known as necessary for the welfare and um, the fundamental rights of so many workers in this country. Well, thanks for the comments. Uh, Rajiv, do you want to respond to some of that? Uh, you, um, you're very right, Professor Sudarshan, and um, that the report that you mentioned, which was written, um, the Arjun Singh Gupta report, it was done in 2005, 6, 7, you know, in that period. Most of that is as valid as it is today, you know, and very little of those very important recommendations were implemented. They were half implemented or there were some kind of, you know, uh, superficial kind of bills were brought into play. And if we look, go back to that report, I think a lot of the problems that I'm talking about will be sorted. And I would like to definitely emphasize that there is, you know, the emphasis on skilling as a policy prescription to the problems of migrants is a very mis misplaced one. When we do skilling, like Sir just mentioned, without correcting labor mar market conditions, it is actually, it takes you nowhere at all. Okay. It means that we've skilled, we have a skilling and we have a skilling program, Shabashish. Okay. We do vocational training. Mm -hmm. The reality is that the entry level wages are as low as 6,000 to 8,000 rupees for work of 10 to 12 hours a day. Okay. Whether it is hotels or small factories or, you know, sites and so on. Now, that kind of that kind of entry into the market is an appalling entry. It is, is actually is a great disincentive to people, young people getting skilled. And certainly people like us will not try to place people in such jobs who are paying less than minimum wages. And so, so there's too much attention, too much corporate attention and state attention to skilling without sorting out the ecosystem of wages, of work conditions. If we improve that, that's when skilling will also become more effective and more enabling. Okay. Uh, uh, questions, please. Questions for Rajiv? Questions, anybody? Well, you know, in that case, let me use my the host's prerogative to uh, uh, to ask you uh, some stuff. I would. It would be. Could you just tell a little bit more about the survey that you were talking about? Uh, uh, the, the context in which you did the survey, like why did you do the survey and sort of, you know, yeah. I know you mentioned a couple of findings, but if you can just share the sort of, you know, some something more. So we were actually trying to, so, you know, since we are headquartered in Udaipur, which is a sending region, and thousands of workers came back in 2020 after the lockdown to rural areas, and we were supporting workers by providing food and providing, you know, other employment assistance and so on. We were also trying to track what happens to these workers when they go back. So about a good 25% of them never went back because they didn't want to experience the same kind of harrowing kind of, you know, repeat of what they experienced last year. So almost one fourth of them stayed back and started to look at options here, which was, you know, TK, they were trying to do that. But when the second lockdown happened, which was now in March, April, May, and again, large numbers came back and I, we thought we have to understand what did people earn or save in the interim period between the first lockdown and the second lockdown and what have they come back with, okay? And which is when we launched, uh, we also wanted to understand what is the nature of assistance that we need to offer. Should it be food? Should it be something else, right? 
And so we did a survey of, we surveyed 6,000 families with a significant migrant worker in them. It is part of our region where we work. And we found that very large numbers of people had, for the work that they had done in the cities, they had only been able to work about 60 to 70% of the time. Wages were down. They had come back without any saving. Those who had contracted the disease, the corona, they were in very, very kind of difficult condition. I mean, they had the life altering kind of, uh, you know, events happened there on that front. But mostly they had survived because of debt. And which is why one of the programs I think he lost the connection. Yeah. Maybe he's log out and log in. What does IT advise? Yeah, we lost connection. I, I just uh, just texted him. I think he's back again. Yeah. It shows him still as uh... yes, the unmute. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think the connection dropped somewhere. I'm sorry about this. That's why now we can hear you well. Yeah. So no, I was just saying that you know, so we basically use the survey to inform what our practice should be. Whether people need more food or they need employment or they need some other kind of intervention. And what we came to is that they need right now a cash assistance to be able to retire their old debt that they've racked up in the last year so that they, they become more credit worthy and they can restart their lives more meaningfully. So we actually set up a whole uh, kind of uh, write-off program for helping people retire their old debt. Yeah, But also it, we came up with stronger policy messages. One of which, for example, that one of the demands that, we, that we've been making that all households of rural areas or tribal areas must be given 150 days of Narega so that there is some assured employment and they should be given uh, additional food uh, as part of the PDS allocation till December, okay? Which is a time that people now need to recover in order to get back to the economy more, more meaningfully. So we need more, not less social protection. We need more to happen. I didn't talk about what should happen in rural areas. Most of my policy kind of, you know, directions were addressing urban conditions. But there's so much more you can do here, you know, also to improve conditions in which distress can reduce. You know, people must migrate, but they need not migrate out of distress. But, you know, that's a whole rural world, you know, to, to turn to. Okay. Any other questions? from our students. They need to use the raise hand option. If you have a question, please, uh, please feel free to raise your hands. In any case, please, uh, you know, I would uh, urge people to check out, uh, uh, you know, our website, which is um, I'll put it on the chat box right now. And so there's more information there. And uh, also check out the social compact uh, site, which is, I think, a interesting new experiment in industry and civil society coming together for labor practice. I think that kind of, uh, uh, you know, new kind of alliance is very much needed. You know, I mean, we've come to feel that actually it may not be the government who will do all the policy work industry might be better suited to do it, you know, so we should start addressing industry uh, more squarely and in a more, I would say, collaborative way rather than, uh, uh, you know, show a combative kind of a front, you know, that labor and industry being kind of opposed to each other, but we, how can we create a more cooperative model of uh, labor welfare with, with, with industry? Which I, yeah, that, I think that's, that's okay. very important to emphasize because I mean, my concern is that, you know, you have these recommendations like the Arjun Sangupta committees and um, the government doesn't pick it up. But then I think industry uh, might be able to um, 
you know, play a bigger part uh, and help. Um, I think uh, not, I, I, I somehow given the composition of uh, our legislators, I, mean, I think India is in a serious crisis of representative democracy where people's representatives don't represent the real interests of people. Um, they represent uh, for the most part themselves and their uh, private interests um, rather than the public interest. And so in the nature of our democracy, I think there is a big problem. Um, you know, so all these promises that are made at the time of elections, um, again, they are all, you know, of a, of a kind, of a sort of a welfareist kind. I'll give you, as Jayalalitha would say, a free television or a free dream mixer or something like that. Uh, and, you know, at the time of their election. But rather than to think of, uh, you know, how do you structure your macroeconomic policies and structure the nature of the economy itself such that there are opportunities for work and decent work with decent wages, I don't think any attention is paid uh, by the political class. Now, the, the policy making class, the bureaucrats are capable of doing it. Uh, but somehow they don't seem to. Um, I think they, they kind of have become more um, psychophantic to political masters than um, they have been in the past uh, over time. And so in this context, I think uh, a realization that if you treat workers well, and uh, so, you know, they are as much investment in their welfare, their skills, their knowledge, their sense of security is going to contribute to um, uh, prosperity within a firm or an industry. I think that constituency uh, is where I think you have, as you've rightly done, um, we need to see some hope in, uh, because the, uh, even if you did get laws, um, you know, that are passed, um, if the, um, if there's no interest in implementing those laws, um, and if they remain largely symbolic and do not serve their instrumental purpose, um, the actions of the state are not going to make a difference. So I think we must really turn to, um, turn to uh, people who are creating jobs and, and work with them to uh, create decent work um, for workers. Um, so I think that we haven't done enough uh, about that, I think. Um, and so as a policy school, I think we have to also reach out more and more um, to people in um, industry um, uh, who create jobs uh, and discuss policy options with them that are doable rather than, um, you know, uh, I, I keep remembering a remark that uh, Professor Rajkrishna, economist from Jaipur University once made uh, when he said that the government of India is knowledge proof just as watches are waterproof. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we need to look elsewhere in please. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's a nice uh, observation, uh, Sudarshan. Uh, we have a question. Uh, Shekhar, you have a question? Shekhar? Shekhar, can you unmute? You can't unmute? Keshav, kindly help Shekhar to unmute himself. No, he can uh, unmute themselves, ma'am. You can unmute yourself, Shekhar. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. I am PhD scholar in Jindal in uh, public policy. Sir, uh, I want to ask two aspects of uh, your observation. Number one about accidents and number two about health. So uh, we all know that government of India and state governments regularly throw a lot of new policies. Uh, for example, there were two in 2015, Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti and Jeevan Suraksha Yojana. And uh, as I was reading the data sets, around 23 to 24 people are enrolled in them and there was for social security. Another is sir, Ayushman Bharat and it says 50 crore people would be enrolled in it and it already says on its page that two crore people have already benefited out of it. So I just want to know, sir, whether these output are 
converting into outcomes what is your observation and if not uh, why migrant uh, migrant or workers are not able to avail these benefits thank you sir so, uh, good question shikhar you know uh, i often say that offering insurance is not the same as offering healthcare okay and to offer insurance is actually like offering a shop which may or may not may not be accessible actually access is very difficult okay what my advice or general call has been to improve safety conditions and reduce hazard at workplace so that accidents and illnesses do not happen it is not to offer another an insurance regardless while you do not correct the conditions of work okay the reality is that by offering insurance we create more bureaucratic hurdles there is a lot of bureaucracy in accessing insurance claims okay but we take the focus away from improving services we need far more uh, deeper services in primary health care okay in rural and urban areas especially in areas that have large populations of workers especially workers who are in, who are exposed to accidents to injuries to burns and electrocutions we need services not just a ayushman bharat kind of an entitlement it is valuable it is necessary but not sufficient okay but what we what we instead do is announce slew of insurance schemes and benefits without correcting the more fundamental cause of the problem Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Okay. I think we have uh, come to the end of our time. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, uh, you know, uh, in that case, we'll we'll wrap this up. Uh, but Rajiv, please do share uh, the you know the link uh, you wanted to share, uh, and you can you can share it with me. I I can share it uh, uh, oh, with uh, yeah. to all the students because some people I notice have left. uh so if you share it with me i can i can uh, share it with the class uh to for with the with the entire uh, student body uh so thank you very much uh for uh, speaking to our students it was a pleasure to have you and you know i mean i think you've raised these questions and i think this this idea i think we've come to this idea about sort of trying to work through the sort of the industry side as opposed to sort of state action that, that's a very interesting uh idea uh it will uh, you know it will ruffle a lot of the state interventionist types and we have a lot of that in india uh but you know i mean this i guess you know this is not the time to get sort of caught in this ideological sort of warfare uh these are serious times difficult times and we have to do what we have to do to sort of move forward so thank you uh for your thoughts thank you very much thank you a pleasure thank you thank, thank you, you rajiv thank you thank you